Good. <clears throat> so, um, thanks for the invitation. Um, I am here to uh, give you a quick update of uh, where we are uh, with uh, Scala 3. So, Scala 3 is essentially the next major iteration of the language. Um, what uh, I have, we have been showing for a number of years now is a roadmap. So here you see it. Uh, the, uh, we are now at the end of 2018, uh, Scala 2.13. Uh, it slipped a bit. Uh, the original plan was that it should be out by now, but now it looks more like it's going to be January. Uh, so Scala 2.13 is, of course, the next uh, version in the current iteration of Scala. And the new thing, the big new thing in Scala 2.13 is a revamped collections. Uh, and uh, the, the one major uh, aspect of the revamped collection is no more can build from, because a lot of people didn't like can build from, so we took it away and we renamed it build from. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, it, it, it's true, but... but uh, uh, it turned out that uh, we uh, we found a way to model basically all user-facing operations from map, flat map, filter without can build from. So all the, all these operations have now the nice types, but there are a couple of funky ones like uh, traverse, uh, uh, essentially applicative traverse in monads that really uh, can be formulated much nicer if there is a build from available. So it turned out that there actually were, were some abstractions that required can build from. So uh, we have now a little module on the side which says, well, if you absolutely insist, here it is, you can still get it, you can still find it, but we won't need it for the mainstream operations. <clears throat> anyway, so that's 2.13. After 2.13, the next slated release is uh, 2.14, uh, but there is also this parallel development which started actually a long time ago, and the code base of Dotty started like six years ago by now. Uh, and uh, since uh, last year, we have regular releases, uh, and uh, that's shaping up to be uh, Scala 3 by 2020. And 2020 is really much uh, closer than it might seem now, because it means that we will have to go in feature freeze, not in 2020, but in 2019. So we will have less than a year to actually finalize the language and essentially nail down all the features. And we planned the last year for essentially stabilization, documentation, uh, porting the ecosystem, and so on. OK, so this sounds uh, scary, I guess, for many of you who have a lot of investment in Scala. So uh, I should essentially tell you uh, why it's not scary, or what, what parts of it are scarier or less scary than others, and also why we're doing it. So why, why Scala 3? Um, so Scala has been actually very uh, uh, stable for the last five, six years, I would say, that uh, essentially since 2002, 2.9, 2.10, not much really has happened. Uh, while 2.2.11 uh, was stabilization, 2.12 was Java 8, that was sort of forced from the environment to, su to support uh, essentially the next version of Java, and 2.13 will be essentially another version that has uh, innovation in the libraries, but not in the core language. The core language has been uh, pretty stable. So what this core language is about, in my opinion, is still a fusion of functional and object-oriented programming. Um, so uh, the, and the reason why I'm insisting on that is that I think that if you do functional alone, then you really miss the aspect of modularity. Uh, so if you want to construct large systems from components, from modules, then Essentially, uh, we can get uh, some good lessons from object or some good intuitions, I should say, from object-oriented programming. And if you look at Scala's incarnation of object-oriented programming, uh, then it actually looks much, much more like an ML module system than a good old Java object with uh, essentially abstract types, uh, path-dependent types. Uh, all these things are all the ingredients that you have in SML generative modules. And so for me, essentially, the modules and the objects, they are one and the same thing. If you want to essentially scale up your applications, then essentially that's Scala's way to express it. And uh, it has, I, I think I can claim that it has been very successful so far, uh, because we, uh, Scala uh, essentially started from uh, statically typed object-oriented core with functional features, and then it essentially added a lot of stuff to it, the closures, function types, 
expression orientation, so no more distinctions between statements and expressions, tuples, uh, local type inference, pattern matching, traits, lazy vowels, by name parameters, x colon t syntax instead of tx, dependent types, implicit parameters, and more. And what you see is that actually most of these things in one way or another have found their ways in other languages. Some languages copy a lot of what, what, what's been done. Outside. So all this is by now uh, not very exciting, but whereas in 2004 when Scala came out, 14 years ago, it was very exciting. Uh, that essentially, no mainstream language had these things. So the fact that essentially by now, most languages have a fairly large subset of these things is actually a uh, reason for, uh, for claiming success. And, uh, uh, but of course, uh, if you claim success and uh, lay back, then you're dead. So uh, the question is, well, building on this foundation, uh, have we learned anything in the last 14 years? Uh, are there some things we can improve in the, in the current version of Scala? And basically, that's what Scala 3 is about. So what, what are the goals, what we want to achieve? Uh, I think foremost is really simplify, 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 uh, because it has to be said that uh, the, uh, the language, while the language is actually fairly modest in size, uh, the programmer experience can be uh, sometimes confusing because there are many, many possibilities and many powerful possibilities to express yourself. So people generally lack guidance. I heard yesterday that essentially a newbie Scala programmer after two weeks asked, well, uh, do I have to write a macro now? And people said, no, you don't have to write a macro now. Macros are actually not even a, an official feature of Scala. But nevertheless, people just drift to that and says, well, we need to essentially get the most powerful uh, uh, tools available in the language, and we have to apply them to everything. And I think that's, that's a big problem. But that said, we should also look at the language to see where we can simplify. And part of the guidance puzzle is that I think, at least in the programmer experience, simplifying means sometimes becoming more opinionated. Uh, so uh, programmers don't generally value a completely uh, neutral set of features that can be abstracted in infinitely many ways. That's very elegant for me as a programming language researcher. That's an ideal. But it turned out that if you actually try that on actual users, uh, users often don't like it because they want more guidance. They want to say, well, essentially, how do I do this? I want, they want a cookie cutter recipe often to say, you do this like that, and that's the only way. And if you say, well, you could do this like this or that, and there's this third op opportunity, then people are confused. Uh, then uh, eliminate inconsistencies and puzzlers. There's this uh, ni very nice book about Scala puzzlers. Uh, I had a good time reading it and trying to solve the puzzles myself. I didn't get all of them. Uh, <laughs> but the same is true for Java, for, for other languages, of course. Uh, so I rem still remember, I, I mean, a long time ago, I wrote the, the official Java compiler. And uh, then my successor as a maintainer of the Java compiler was Neil Gafter, who's also the author of the Java Puzzles book. And he was as extremely gleeful if he could, uh, again, show me a puzzle that I couldn't solve. I said, what? You wrote the compiler. You can't do You don't even know what it should do. That. Well, there, there you go. Uh, <clears throat> one thing we can do now, and we should profit now, when we started Scala, we did so a bit in a void because uh, we didn't really have very good foundations. Uh, the foundations that existed in languages were things like featherweight Java, so essentially the core calculus for Java, which was very, very limited, or a lambda calculus, which essentially covers only the functional part, and uh, uh, or the ML module system liter literature, which is extensive, but we wanted to do something else. We didn't want to fall into the ML groove there. So by now, we have those strong foundations with the dot calculus, and they have in already influenced the language design in many, many strong ways, in many, very good ways, that we, are, we, we essentially have now very good guidance to say a certain feature it, it, that would map very well into our formal calculus, or this other feature wouldn't map so well, or for, for this third feature, we can actually show that it's unsound, that you shouldn't do this because you would, would get type errors at runtime. So that helped a lot. And finally, what we want to do is essentially, essentially cons consolidate the language constructs to improve consistency, safety, and ergonomics. Um, going back to simplify, uh, I just want to uh, show you one graph to show th that shows that, as seen as a language, Scala is actually not an outlier in complexity. And uh, 
that's generally, uh, I think for many people this graph is quite surprising. That you say of sort of a lot of different mainstream languages out there, which is the most complex in terms of features. Uh, so I measured features by size of the uh, context-free grammars, but uh, there are other uh, measures that go, go along with it. You could also count keywords or whatever. Uh, size of the spec, uh, things like that. The, lo the, the biggest one is actually C sharp. Uh, so that's a huge language, and it's generally not perceived to be a very complex language. And I think that's precisely because C sharp just has got a recipe for everything you want to achieve. So you just says, says I want this, and in the long catalog, you can can say, okay, language feature X here that will do it for me. Whereas if you have a language like Scala or Haskell in the languages here that have few, fewer features, then essentially you have this problem of composition. Um, Haskell, I have cheated a little bit because that's Haskell core Haskell, Haskell 98, which nobody uses. Uh, you have to add that to literally 85 language flags uh, on top of that. So actual Haskell is that plus essentially 85 features that uh, are, are all guided by a language flag or another. I haven't counted how big the, the, the syntax would be. Okay, so let me just run down some of the... Um, uh, things that will be in Scala, and I'll be very quick because I've gone through these before. So uh, essentially we will have a number of new types. Uh, there are intersection types, which are essentially a sanitized versions of with types, a with b, uh, without some of the quirks of with types. Uh, the union types, which are the duals of intersections. Uh, so if you look at a language like um, TypeScript, then uh, you will find the same types there. And there was it's also a language like Salem that has them. So they are by now sort of not super exotic anymore. Uh, we have essentially the next thing here is essentially a program to lift methods to be first class. So to say, well, methods can have a lot of attributes that we, you don't have in functions. So for instance, methods can be implicit. They can have implicit parameters. So the, a, a rather big step is actually to lift that to functions, and that gives us implicit function types. And that, I have already given talks about that, that can fundamentally change essentially the ways you structure your programs and give you quite a lot of power because it's a canonical way to inject context, essentially to talk about context to abstract context. Another thing you can do with methods is uh, they can have dependent types. So the method result type can depend on its parameters. Uh, so it would be nice to have dependent function types. So that's sort of the first step to go to full dependent types. Uh, so in the dependent type literature, literature, you call that a product type or a pi type, uh, this, this thing. Uh, so uh, we, uh, Scala 3 will have those as well. Um, another thing for consistency is straight parameters. So Classes can have parameters. Why should traits not have parameters? Uh, so that's something that actually is uh, uh, could uh, still land in Scala 2.14 because it's sort of one of the things that is already very far along. And, this, uh, uh, and the next one, which I will talk a little bit more later, is uh, generic tuples. Uh, so the idea is that we want to uh, first, lift the limit of 22 for everything. So now we will have essentially functions that of arbitrary sizes, tuples of arbitrary sizes, and you want to have generic operations over those tuples. So it should be able, for instance, if you have two tuples, uh, to take the concatenation of those tuples and get a tuple that has a type that's better than just tuple, that really gives you the element types. But that means you essentially have to go into generic data type generic programming. And I'll tell you a little, show you a little bit later how we do that. Uh, for, for ergonomics, there are some um, improvements here where uh, when we started out uh, with Scala, the, uh, the rule, ruling dogma was really object-oriented programming, classes uh, uh, and, and objects, interfaces, things like that. Uh, so we found that it was already pretty cool that we could ma model ADTs, abstract data types, uh, algebraic data types, using case classes and traits and these things. And people have used it a lot, so success again. But again, uh, the, the problem, or it's not a problem, but it's an observation that since people use a lot the same patterns over and over again in coding and algebraic data type with, with case classes, there is a... Um, a, a a motivation to make this shorter. 
Uh, so we have enums, so here you see just a simple enum of color, uh, but you can extend that to essentially also do an ADT like option or list or any other ADTs because you can essentially there's a single construct enum that goes from enumerations to ADTs. Uh, the other one which was really atrocious was uh, type lambdas, uh, so Scala 3 didn't have them, but uh, I mean people are creative, they found truly amazing ways to encode type lambdas as a refinement with some of these Unicode lambda thingies and then type projection. And um, So it actually turned out that these uh, techniques, they were, they had an, a core that was unsound, so you couldn't, uh, the, the, these things actually relied on an unsound feature of the type system. But of course, it's perfectly um, understandable and reasonable to want type lambdas because, I mean, hey, if you can have named uh, higher kind of types, then you should have anonymous higher kind of type expressions. Uh, otherwise, it's just an irregular case. So we fixed that by essentially giving you syntax for type lambdas that looks like this. Okay, what about safety? So safety, um, there's one thing that uh, I believe will help a lot. Uh, so for, I mean, Scala and generally statically typed languages, they're great for refactoring, right? So if you have a big code base, then uh, the, the more precise the types are, the better, because if you start to refactor things, then the types will essentially be a safety net. If you are in a dynamically typed language, that's essentially a moment where you have to fear that you introduce a lot of new bugs in your refactorings in a statically typed language. It's much, much better. Except there's one thing that has, has actually prevented me from doing large-scale refactorings, and that's uh, universal equality. So the, the issue is you want to change, let's say, the type from, let's say, string to essentially a name container or something like that. And you should say, well, that should be okay. I mean, I'll just change it and then I fix all the type errors and it should be done. No, it, it, that's, uh, there's one exception to that, and that's, let's say, you compare a string against another string, against a, li a string literal. Then uh, essentially that would give you a true comparison, whereas if you compare it with your new final string container, you'd always get false. So you would essentially get a different uh, result. And, and that is essentially the, the, one, the one remaining uh, problem that really prevents large-scale refactorings. Now, the problem is that equality in, uh, in Scala and in Java is really baked in. So people have proposed to say, well, let's just essentially use essentially uh, a, a version of like triple equals that is a type class and that you essentially can, can uh, define for types. And if it's not def defined for a type, then, uh, then it won't apply. But the problem is that there are such a lot of applications that use, for instance, a hash table for any key type whatsoever. So a hash table, you can't uh, parameterize that with a type class because it comes from Java. So Java is the hash table, it uses universal hashing. And it's quite useful. And uh, there are also useful applications where you want to do that even without the types. Let's say you have something and you just want to do um, uh, essentially uh, some sort of memoization where you say, well, if uh, essentially it's the same thing, then I want to have a hash table, which is maybe even the identity hash to say, okay, if it happens to be the same object, then essentially I have computed the result already. So again, uh, we have a problem with, with equality here. So equality is there, but uh, the idea with multiversal equality then is to essentially have, together with universal equality, a witness that says, okay, yes, you can compare these two types. So I can still pass anything to my Java hash map because it doesn't know any better. It will compare anything with anything. But in my Scala programs, I can require the certificate that essentially type A can be compared with type B and the certificate is type class based. So I can essentially uh, wire that up any way I want. And since we have done that, we already found a lot of uh, errors in our own compiler over the time when people actually did, did wrong refactoring. So I can attest to it really helps. Um, there, there are also some other plans which are currently underway, uh, but we're not sure whether they're going to be in time for 3.0. Uh, so one is null safety. Uh, so null safety is on the surface. You say, well, just do it. You have all the tools now available uh, because you can just say a type like string doesn't have a null. A null is you don't want to have nulls in your strings. And if you want to have something that can be a null, for instance, 
a re return type of a Java hash map that claims to return a string, but really if it's not in the map, it will give you null, then you can always write string or null. So that's, that's a very good type for, for nullable types, and the types will track it. And indeed, all this is very straightforward, and if it was just that, we would already have done it. Uh, the main issue is really um, uh, compatibility uh, and interoperability with Java. So it's very hard to do this in a way that essentially doesn't overwhelm uh, the Scala side with annotations and casts uh, if you have to do to deal with a lot of Java code. So we are still finding a good way to express that, and we're still trying to find a good way to express that. And we made some progress, uh, but I can't promise anything because it's, I don't think it's a done deal yet. Okay, and then there's a lot of things that uh, we would like to remove. Um, so um, here, here's a list of them. So we're, we're going to remove existential types, so no more for some. Uh, wildcards will stay. Uh, we're going to remove procedure syntax. Well, that's a minor one. Uh, early initializers will be replaced by trade parameters. XML literals will, will be replaced by a string interpolator for XML. Limit 22, so everything can be as long as, as you wish. Uh, functions, tuples. Um, uh, pro uh, probably also the again, uh, automatic um, insertion of, um, of parents. So essentially the, the previous one where we said, well, essentially, if, it's, if they're empty parents after function, then that's optional. Uh, we're going to be more strict about that. So you declare it with parents, you use it with parents, or vice, or, or vice versa. You don't declare it, you don't use it. Um, concept of weak, for, weak performance for collections, uh, auto-tuppling, <coughs> multi-parameter infix operators. These were sort of all co little conveniences that in the end caused more surprises for people than they were worth it. So we are, we are trying hard to remove them from, from the language. So how are, we gonna go, uh, how are we going about doing that? So there's a process. Uh, we have the Scala improvement uh, process uh, and proposals. And each uh, feature that essentially we want to either remove or add uh, will be discussed in that process. Uh, and for each of these steps, uh, we have a discussion period on Scala contributors. So we essentially discussed the, first, the batch of first 10 proposals already. Uh, where essentially we tell people what they are, what the reference is to the, to the proposal, and then invite comments. And uh, afterwards, there's a session of the SIP committee that essentially discusses the comments, and at some point, there's a vote. We'll have a long uh, session right after this conference in Lausanne. Uh, it's our first uh, essentially in-person session of three days, where essentially all the SIP committee members will come and. Uh, and hopefully uh, come to a, a, an agreement on essentially, uh, hopefully, many of the features that are submitted here. So the SIP sessions are also live streamed, not the in-person session. I think we only do summaries after each day because I think nobody should sit in front of a screen for, for three, four days. Uh, but for the normal ones, uh, we, we, they are live streamed and people can comment on chats in real time. And the other requirement is that every feature we uh, accept must have an implementation in, in the DOTI compiler. Okay, so speaking of the DOTI compiler, what does tooling uh, look like right now? So we have this new compiler called .c, and it's also essentially the thing that drives uh, IDEs. Uh, so uh, the, uh, we, we uh, support IDEs through LSP. Uh, so I should say non-IntelliJ IDEs. IntelliJ have their own compiler as usual. Uh, but uh, you can essentially use this for VS Code or anything else that supports LSP. Um, we have a REPL, we have a doc tool, and we have essentially a sort of an emerging platform around which most tooling is built and that is uh, Tasty. So Tasty is uh, an abbreviation for typed abstract syntax trees, and it's essentially a ser serialization format for Scala. So uh, if you, if a comp when a compiler compiles a file, it has to essentially outline in the file what's available for other compilation units to use. So the compiler will essentially consult that information 
and uh, decide on essentially what code to generate and whether the types are correct or not. But we actually go much further. We don't only serialize the interfaces, we serialize the complete implementation, everything. So the whole uh, uh, tree, uh, that syntax tree that represents a Scala function is serialized in this format. And not just the, 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 the tree itself, but we also can essentially recover the full type information of everything and the full composition information of, of everything. Uh, and furthermore, all implicits are expanded out. So this gives you essentially a very, very detailed version of what is in your, in your, in your Scala file and what the compiler sees it. Uh, one might worry, and I worried at first, that this would be very bulky, so I thought this, you can't get this for less than, let's say, 10 times size of source, uh, this sort of thing. But it turned out that uh, one could apply a lot of tweaks, and uh, so in the end, the serialized uh, format of a Scala program is about roughly the same size as the source, uh, which is uh, pretty, pretty decent and I think uh, quite, quite practical in, at, at that size. Okay, so this Tasty is at the core of a lot of what we do and of our initiatives. So uh, the, what we currently have is essentially that the Dotty, uh, which will be Scala 3, can compile into Tasty and like I said, the compiler also consults the Tasty trees to figure out what's in other files. Not just for type checking, but also for inlining, uh, macro, macro expansion and so on. Uh, we have a, a prototype, a proof of concept, I should say, that has shown that the same can be done for the Scala 2 version. So, uh, Guillaume Matres did a, did a, a fast, quick prototype, uh, and he got, got it so far that he could compile vector.scala, so one of the more bulky library classes, into, into this, this tasty format and, and, and compile it from there with essentially the, the standard .dot compiler, and things worked. Uh, so we are going to work hard on that to make that more than a proof of concept, to make that a reality that we can really map from Scala 2 to the same platform. Because once we have that, we have uh, uh, much more freedom with uh, essentially uh, uh, composition of uh, Scala 2 and Scala 3 components. If uh, Scala 2 and Scala 3 can essentially agree on the binary format, then you will be able to freely mix and match modules in Scala 2 and Scala 3 in the future. And I think this will be huge. Um, Tasty is also the thing that supports the IDEs uh, via LSP, Microsoft's Language Server Protocol. So basically the IDEs, uh, they, uh, VS Code, in, for, for instance, or others that use LSP, they essentially consult uh, the Tasty trees that are generated live by the compiler. And finally, Tasty is, uh, could, can be the output for essentially a number of formats, uh, different versions of class files, uh, JavaScript files, native files, and so on. So that's not realized yet, but uh, the, the vision is that one should be able to also publish an artifact simply as a Tasty module and say, okay, then if you need that, let's say for a later version of Java or you, if you want a JavaScript version, then essentially you can do that yourself in, on your client side build. So, so, to, so to say, we can actually essentially populate the caches of your client side build, not by essentially resolving an, an artifact directly from the class file or JavaScript file, or doing that, but if it's missing, then we can get the tasty instead and compile it for you. So that, that would be a, a big win for build stability because since Tasty is a platform that's essentially controlled by, by Scala, uh, we can uh, commit to keeping that a lot more stable than essentially the output from Scala to a Java file format which changes from 6 to 8 to 11 or things like that. And also uh, a lot of the uh, encodings actually show up and show through so that if you uh, do some things to your, your high-level library that should be binary stable, by the time it gets translated to class files, it isn't. So use cases of Tasty are separate compilation, language servers, uh, also macros, and uh, cross-building. So that brings me to the biggest issue that we have with Scala 2 and Scala 3, and that's metaprogramming. So, so far, the status quo is that we have uh, def macros, uh, which actually are still uh, not an official feature of Scala, they're experimental. 
there's something even wilder, which is called macro paradise, um, and uh, then uh, there's something more uh, modern and stable Scala Meta. So macro paradise is essentially a compiler plugin uh, that is used for a lot of the more advanced macro stuff, um, and um, the problem with both of these is uh, that they are really just a thin layer on top of the old Scala compiler, NSC. Uh, the, uh, and that means everything, all the details of the old Scala compiler shine through. So if you do advanced macro programming, then you really interact with this compiler thing. And it's not pretty. So I uh, had a conversation with uh, Eric Meyer, at, uh, who's at Facebook and doing essentially TensorFlow programming. They're working on a, on a Scala uh, plugin for the compiler to, to, do, to, to do TensorFlow output. And he said, you know, it's called Macro Paradise, but it really should be called Macro Hell. <laughs> so I think that probably rings a bell in many of us to say, well, it's really hard to program with these things. And they are non-portable. You can't port them to the new compiler because it's a new compiler. We can't, we can't just essentially keep all the APIs that don't, just don't exist anymore. So Scala Meta is essentially a, a, a new thing which is, uh, uses external tools that analyze and transform the programs. It's compiler independent, but it also does less than essentially normal macros can do. So it's more for essentially code analysis, uh, code querying, and less for essentially code. Uh, but it's it's good for source code generation, but it's less less useful for essentially code generation on the fly. So what we have for meta programming is essentially still a uh, macro system, um, but it's essentially rewired, rebuilt up from um, some fundamental operators that are uh, very principled and give you by themselves not a lot of power. So essentially what we can do is we can say if we have a piece of code, then we can say treat this piece of code as data, and that's done by quoting it to say, okay, so now this thing is data, but it's still a black box, so it's just code. You, don't, you can't get at it what it is exactly. So what can you do with the code? Well, you can uh, splice other code in it, so that's the splice thing. So you can say, well, give me another piece of code and put it here. So you can build up code, and then at the end, uh, if you want, you can run it, uh, or you can uh, essentially inline things like that. So it turns out that if you mix these operators, quote, splice, and inline, then you get macros. Uh, and if you mix them, close, quote, splice, and run, then you get staging. So staging in the form of, let's say, LMS or, or other advanced staging frameworks. Okay. So what do these things do? So I said quote lifts from essentially code to data. So these are called expressions, so from T to expression of T, and uh, splice goes the other way. And you can't look inside an expression, so you don't know a lot about uh, what, what this code is. So it's very safe. But sometimes it's uh, actually not powerful enough. So uh, to give you more is we give you essentially another mapping, reflect and reify between this and our tasty format, the tasty trees. So there's a bijection between that and a lower level format where we do expose uh, the trees. You could say, hey, yeah, but isn't, aren't you going essentially fully back to uh, what you wanted to get away from? Isn't that exposing compiler internals and things like that? Well, um, hopefully not quite, because what we're talking about here is a serialization format, and it's not a compiler. So it's like essentially fixing and exposing details of the class file format, which Java also does and a lot of libraries depend on. So in that sense, I think we have found a way to say, well, you, we can essentially expose that without the, the, the problems that we would usually have. Okay, so meta programming levels, I should say that essentially we have uh, these two levels, level one is quotes and splices, that's very safe and tasty reflection gives you essentially the, added, the, the additional power. Okay, so one thing that uh, is important here is that these new macros are black box. So they get expanded after type checking. Uh, so that means macros must type check, uh, programs must type check before the macros are expanded. And uh, it also means that macros al always work on trees that are already typed. So that has a big advantages because it means that, for instance, hygiene or non-hygiene is not, a, not an issue at all. Everything is completely typed. You have symbolic references. So it's hygienic by definitions. And it reduces 
drastically the number of things that can go wrong. But um, it, like I said, the, the, the macros, they are only black box macros. And that could look very serious because there are quite a, use, quite a lot of use cases for white box macros out there. So I just wanted to give you a quick rundown what you could do. So here's a typical white box macro. It's the F interpolator, which essentially does floating point numbers. If you take any other interpolator, XML or whatever, they're all the same basically. So that's currently a white box macro because if you have this F thing, so if I do expand it, then that's what it would look like. So here's my F. Uh, then essentially it takes what it sees here and it will conclude A, I see three I here. So that should be an int uh, and uh, it will generate this type for the, for the X. So it will say, well, the X must be an int and I will return a string. So that type gets computed by the macro. And we can't do that anymore because that's white box. I mean, macros can't compute types anymore. So, but what you could do instead is you can say, well, we all, we always have a good fallback type for these string interpolators, and that's just give me a, a sequence of things that are any anything, and uh, I will give you back a string. I said, yeah, yeah, but that, that doesn't work, right? That negates the the, the advantages of type checking, uh, and that's true, but. Uh, the macro can, of course, do the type checking itself then after the fact. So when the macro runs, it can say, okay, I see a 3i here, let's see whether the uh, actual argument is actually in it. And if not, it can issue a type error. So uh, the idea, uh, yeah, uh, uh, okay, yeah. So uh, another technique is uh, essentially that generalizes this a little bit is to pass types into a macro. So let's say you have a white box macro like this, and it has a computed return type. So that's what makes it a white box macro. So like that. So what we can always do is uh, we can rewrite M to be of this type here, where we say, OK, uh, give me a type argument, and that's the type that we return. Uh, and then it, uh, essentially what we, here we have the macro implementation, and then you see essentially two quotes that says, okay, so here's the, the, the expression that you give me, that you gave me, and here's the type that you can, can, gave me. And then the macro implementation can actually check that the computed type matches uh, the expected type of T. So it can just look at, at the actual argument and says, well, what type does it have? Is, does that actually match the type that it requires? And if yes, then we're good. And if not, then uh, the macro can issue a type error. So the only thing that uh, means what you have to do is if you apply the macro then like this, is you have to give a type because the macro can't compute the type. But as long as the user gives a type in the library and says, well, I call this macro and this should be the return type, you're good. Okay, still you could say, well, that's actually very limiting. So uh, why no, no macros? Uh, why no white box macros? So the answer is we really, really want to avoid running untrusted user code in the presentation compiler. So if you run an editor, then you shouldn't be at the mercy of an, well, an ill-written macro that freezes your thing, that crashes your thing, that all, all these things. So what we do right now is, is a little bit crazy that we essentially we say there's completely untrusted user code that gets run on every keystroke you edit a Scala program if your, program, if your code is, is essentially, essentially uses a, a full-blown presentation compiler. If you want better tooling experiences, we must stop doing this. And so, in the future, all macro code is run when the types are already computed. So it's better for the macros, it's safer for the macros, it's, and macros are, can be more isolated than them. That doesn't stop us from doing advanced things like creating new definitions. Uh, it just means that one cannot depend on these definitions in the same project. So one can always generate code and do everything in macro paradise. If, but one has to do this in an upstream project, and then essentially you generate a bunch of tasty stuff, and the downstream projects can use that. The advantage also is, if you do it that way, then you can actually inspect your code at your leisure and saying, okay, I generated all this thing, let's look at what exactly I generated, let's just decompile the tasty, and if it looks okay, then we're fine, and essentially my downstream project can use it. Okay, but of course you can say, well, but some macros are really language extensions, so should we, sh do we have to drop them? What should we do about them? And uh, the answer there is we will find language uh, level solutions for these. So we have identified some of them. So for instance, the lazy macro in, in, 
in shapeless is already uh, essentially uh, subsumed by, by name implicits, type lambdas, kind projectors, um, context injections, uh, type level functions uh, are in progress, and type class derivation is to do. Uh, I'm out of time, uh, but uh, I really only had half an hour to talk. I don't know, should I go a little bit longer, or what should we do? Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so let me talk a little bit uh, to finish with uh, with the type level programming. So, type level programming, uh, it, the status quo is something like this. So you use implicit. Uh, so here we have the thing that we want to essentially represent the concatenation of two age lists, and that's how you do it. So basically, you do it indirectly. You can say you can't really talk about the type that concats to age lists, you, but you can essentially generate it by through an implicit. An implicit can give you a value that somehow ha happens to have this type. So that's essentially what you do here. And it's uh, kind of roundabout. Uh, looks like logic programming with your hands tied behind your back. So uh, can we do better? Um, that's what we tried over the summer. Uh, so we first looked at a, a, a rather neat solution, but then we got back, we got away from it again. So what we looked at is to say, well, can we um, somehow partially evaluate functions? So if I wanted to write a concat function of two age lists, then can I maybe write it like this? That looks like a concat function in, I don't know, Python or JavaScript or something like that. No, well, if you just drop this. Uh, so basically, no significant types, they're all age lists. So what you get back is an age list that doesn't give you a lot. But it actually turns out that if you match, map this, uh, add the transparent modifier to this function, then you can do a lot more. So what you see here is we have two age lists, XS, Ys. We concatenate them, and then we actually find that the result has, lo and behold, essentially the age list with the four elements that you have here. And the trick that uh, why this worked was uh, we inline the concat method. We inline it with these arguments, and then we recompute the type with the, with, the, with the actual arguments types. And by doing that, we get a more precise type. So that looks good, but in the end, we backed out. Uh, so I should tell you why. So um, the problem with that is was that the computation, um, I mean, it's, it's great when it works, but it was really hard to predict when it worked and when it didn't. So basically, the, the mode was we looked at it and we said, OK, no, this doesn't, doesn't simplify to the thing we want. Let's tweak it a little bit more. OK, now it works. But that's the sort of experimental programming that we want to get away from. So it wasn't predictable enough. It wasn't also super efficient. So for like huge age lists of thousands of elements, it got very, very slow. And finally, it's sort of, you can object on a philosoph philosophical ground that it breaks down the separation between the API and, and the implementation. The implementation is the type. You don't even tell what the, what the exact, exact type is. It is the implementation. So in the end, we didn't do that. So what did we do instead? We did something, essentially, the, the most simple thing we could have get away with, and that's match types. So what I want to do is just uh, show you uh, quickly what, what we can do here. Um, um. Okay, so what, what, what I have here is essentially a, a little worksheet. Um, so that actually shows the uh, IDE and the compiler in action. So that's a recent addition to this. So we have these, these worksheet-like functionality. And <clears throat> what we um, can, so I, what, I, what I can do is I can just change this and it just immediately uh, evaluates everything. So what we want to do now is, let's say we want to write a method that reverses a tuple. Uh, so a tuple int boolean should be uh, a boolean int. And we want to express that as a type generically over all tuples. So how would, would we do that? So I have a little helper method, which is called append. And we can have a look at that, what that is first. <coughs> 
So what append is, it says, okay, it takes a tuple <coughs> and an element and uh, it will return your tuple and it's a type. And then in the type, I can do a match. I can say, well, let's match on this X tuple here. If it's unit, so unit is the empty tuple, uh, then essentially take the Y and uh, is, uh, they, they take a single element tuple which consists of Y and unit. So the star colon is essentially the cons for our tuples to say. An element and a tuple gives you a tuple. <coughs> and then you can also pattern match <coughs> on the star colon thing to say, well, if it's uh, an element and another tuple, then it's X1 followed by X append and the element with the starter tuple. <laughs> Okay, so now let's do reverse. Um, so it's uh, essentially the same thing here. So uh, if it's unit, then uh, I, I give you back. Uh, sorry, is that, no, that's not the right one. It's just that. If, it, if, it's, if it's unit, I give you back unit or x. And if it's a cons, so let's write it like this, then what should I do? Well, I should do an append of reverse of uh, xs1 with x1, right? Okay, cool. So now we have defined reverse and the editor is happy. How do I test it? Well, we let's write a method that essentially do test this. So it takes a tuple and uh, type t, and it gives us reverse of t. And since I'm out of time, and I'll just make this math. I, I leave out the implementation. It doesn't matter. We compute on the types. Who cares about uh, implementation of these things, right? <laughs> okay. So let's let's just do this. Def r equals reverse of tuple one. Let's. Let's do some tuple like this, uh, an int, a string, and the thing. So let's see what this does. Okay, so yeah, that looks actually pretty good. It's a boolean followed by a string, followed by append unit int. Uh, it didn't simplify the types as much because it's sort of lazy by expanding these, these match types. But we can, of course, force it. We can say, well, we believe this should be a tr triple with a, consisting of a boolean and a string and an int. And now, now please check, and yeah, so it's, it's fine, it didn't lie. So we can just do, try to, to, to say, well, if it's, if it's something different, then yes, of course, you would, you would get an error. So we gave it the right one. Okay, cool. So that was just a quick ex, uh, excursion to this thing, and I really should wrap up now. So let me just do this like this. Okay, so uh, the, the last thing is about migration. So how do we get there? Um, <clears throat> despite all the differences, Scala 2 and 3 are still fundamentally the same language. So there is a common subset, which is quite powerful, that essentially both of them map to. So it should be easy to actually cross-build for, for a while. Uh, and furthermore, we have extensive rewrite tools by now that can handle much of the rest, except for macros. So macros are the big thing because they can't be automatically rewritten. But everything, most, most of the other things can. So if there's a difference, then most of the other things a rewrite tool can do. And the other big thing is that I, because of static typing and binary compatibility, I think the migration will be much smoother than uh, the uh, example of Python that is people often uh, cite as essentially a warning because A, uh, the, uh, if there are incompatibilities, things that essentially break, then they're typically type errors, and you can fix them before you go into production, and B, you can mix and match library modules from both sides. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, you can try it out today. <laughs> I always wanted to say that um, we are actually hiring. Uh, I'm no, normally, I'm, I never say that, but now we are hiring. <laughs> so we, I'm looking for essentially two people who are uh, familiar with Scala and good compiler engineers. So this is some really hardcore compiler work to actually finish this job that I told you about so far. So it should be very exciting work. If you know of somebody or you are yourself available, talk to me afterwards. Thank you.